now. And here you can see the hardened material where the sand and the rock has been fused together. This is all hard right here. It wow. extends it extends approximately eighth of a mile to a quarter of a mile in length. And I assume that's the width of the opening that they had. And that is, you know, that, that's enough to keep the Egyptians back. And it's certainly more than one little lightning strike and a little bit of melted sand. <laughs> it's something constant, you know, standing there in their way. Uh, you know, they did stand between them to keep them separated. A pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, you know, different times. Mm -hmm. This is another visit that we were there. The water is more calm. Mm -hmm. But once again, we're going to see the melted beach here. We'll go down to the edge of the waters. And that would make sense because God protected his people, as, as we remember in the text, it says all night he, he separated them all from during the, the night. Egyptians. Yes, yes. And right in the foreground here, wow, you can that. notice that this looks smooth. This has been melted together. And there's nothing else that would create that. There, there's no other explanation That's for right. It. This, is, this is a very smooth material, and it's, it's the native material. It's not something that's been poured here. And this is a long distance where this is hardened. Again, we see Saudi Arabia in the distance. That's ancient Midian. Midian is where Mount Sinai is located, according to the Bible. And so we're taking a look straight down at this hardened material. You see this large stone stuck in it. Yeah, it's just melted right in. It's melted in. Yes, it is. Goodness. Yeah, it looks smooth in areas. Here it's not as smooth, but you can see how hard it is. And we're going to take a sample of it. And you would think that the, the, uh, the tides would, would loosen that, if anything. It wouldn't, wouldn't fuse them together. It shows the uh, rigidity of the material. Here John's breaking off a piece of it. But you can see it's smooth on top there. And all the rocks fused together. It's the native, look at native rocks all together. Of a horse hoof, it's shriveled up since it's come out of the water. But uh, that's consistent again with the biblical record today that horses are not native to the area. Here is a, it appears to be an eight spoke chariot wheel with a raised center hub. Now all these chariot remains have a raised center hub. That's one thing you can look for and they have used metal detectors on them. This is another one here with just the spokes sticking out. Again, the raised center hub. And so here we see a human rib cage, top left and possibly part of an arm just to the right of that. Oh yeah, you can see that. Yeah, look photo Ron that. took. And here is a chariot wheel, perhaps it's on an axle, it's standing up. There's a raised center hub in the center there. And you've got the sp three spokes, but you've got perfect right angles there. And then where the wooden um, rim of the wheel would be has eroded away. But where you've got the hub, that would be made of metal, so that's what remains. And that's in quite shallow water. However, you do get a reading. So that's the way you know that if you've got a wheel shape and you get a metal, and so here's Aaron over one of the chariot wheel remains. Again, you see the raised center hub area and then the spokes coming out from that. But Danny and Ronnie are going to talk about finding this gold-plated chariot wheel at 180 feet deep. It's quite amazing. We took pictures of and the coral was all grown over it, but you could tell the shape of it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And you could see even like some of the pictures now that they so, from what I understand, they found a total of three of these gold-plated chariot wheels. This is one of them here, and it appears it was covered with sand, and they gradually brushed the sand off of it. They probably saw the shape of it through the sand, and coral does not grow on gold. And so, that's why you would not see coral attached to this one. That could be a loose piece of coral laying there, but uh, quite amazing. So potentially that one, if someone allowed, one day could be brought up and tested and that would be definitive evidence. Right, yes. And we're told there were 600 choice chariots that were, that were uh, caught up in the waters there. Now, in 2009, I put together a Rove machine, remote operational vehicle with a camera on it, and we rented this boat here. 
to go out to the crossing area. We're headed to the south end of the beach and we're going to take a look at what's under the water there. You see Saudi Arabia in the distance. It's a pretty day here. And so we're in the approximate area and we're going to put out the underwater camera. And we're getting it ready to launch. We used just about three hours and we did get an image of something that's possibly a chariot wheel. This has got three motors on it. You can turn it left, right, up and down. So very much like a, an aerial drone, just, just underwater. Yes, it's got, I got a cable attached, a 100 foot tether. I brought it in through Cairo and in my piece of luggage. And, uh, right, sure. Are you ready? So we're launching it here. And then this is an onboard replay. And the water here is clear. This is gonna clear up here in a second. But uh, again, you cannot put an anchor out. And so the boat is constantly drifting. It's usually to the south. And so you have to go with the flow. And some of these could be parts from the Egyptian army. I saw one piece there that almost looked like it could have been a hub uh, yeah. in the first part of the film. Yeah, there. you don't know what is what, but... Uh... Wow, look at that. Yes. And this is, a, for coral just to appear out of nowhere, it needs to grow on something. It has it to just grow on the sand. Right, it has to attach to something. And so some of this could be from Pharaoh's army. Now, if we could keep it going here, we'll see the chariot wheel come up in a few seconds here. This is a large clump. It could be part of a chariot uh, cab. But our next image here is going to be, I believe, the chariot wheel that we think I'm controlling here up top. This is about three hours of controlling it. We're getting some video, video coming in into the camera here digitally. We're recording it. And then here we're gonna come upon the wheel. So there it is in the bottom left. It's round, it has a raised center hub. And it's perhaps still on the axle. It's at like a 70 degree angle. And so to me, it's this possibility that that was a chariot mm. wheel. So Mount Sinai should be in Arabia. This is Arabia over here on the right side. The Sinai Peninsula is not Arabia. So Moses fled from Egypt to Midian. This is the land of Midian. It's in Saudi Arabia. It's not in the Sinai Peninsula. So he was supposed to bring the people back to the mountain here in Saudi Arabia. That's what he was instructed to do. So we're gonna to go to the Arabian beach. We see a camel crossing sign. Hey, we must be in Saudi Arabia. And now we've got somebody <laughs> racing us here. You see these camels out in the countryside quite often. Huh. Just like deer in North America. Yeah, but actually you can see these more, but yeah. So here's the Gulf of Aqaba. We're in Saudi Arabia. I'm driving the truck here. You can see Egypt on the other side. So this is the biblical Yom Suf, or Red Sea. It's mentioned in Exodus 13. You know, it makes sense that, that Moses would come back to, to the mountain. That, that's just the, the Hebrew way of thinking is cyclical. Things don't happen once, they just they happen in, in cycles and uh, you end up uh, where you started off oftentimes. That's right, God told him, bring the people back to this mountain. He did just that. And so we're driving along the coastline here. Again, that's Egypt in the distance finally made it into Saudi Arabia. And so we're over on the opposite beach. Beautiful waters here. Looking back now at Egypt. But, yeah, looking back over at Sinai Peninsula, Egypt, and the waters of the Red Sea crossing. So this is where Pharaoh's army would have washed up, right here. And they were able to collect their weapons and that was interesting, that what the, uh, the Wyatt boys had, had yeah. mentioned. I had not considered that before. We were able to pick them clean of their weapons. They had to fight the Midianites, Amalekites, and termites. <laughs> 
So here is Edward and Sam in 2017. They saw the marker for the pillar that was cut down that matched the one on the Egyptian side. It's no longer there, sadly. It's been moved away. And so Vivica Ponton, she went diving here at this location. I got my picture taken with her. She's from, I believe, Sweden uh, there in e Europe. But um, she got this great photograph of a chariot wheel there on the Saudi Arabian side. Hmm. And look how round this look, and it looks. And again, it's got the ray center hub. Again, consistent every time we've got the hub from both sides. As a marker, yes. Parts on both sides. Now we're heading to a possible site. Here on the map, we can see the site that we're headed to, the bottom left here. It's at Makna, an oasis near the Gulf of Aqaba or Red Sea. And so we're pulling into the parking area. You can see the beautiful palm trees here. It's a photogenic site. Wow, beautiful. Yeah, you see the Gulf of Aqaba, and here are the springs down here. Now, is this a, a possible or a confirmed site it's for Mara? It's not confirmed. This is just one of the contenders for Mara. We don't know which site is actually Mara exactly, but this is one of them we're taking a look at. Now, Elim, which were, uh, I'm assuming you had some footage of that. that, that yeah, we'll that be is seeing, working. yeah, we'll see Elim shortly here. It's, it's the correct site. We know for sure that one is. But this is just a possibility here. A number of visitors came there when we were there. Are the waters still bitter? I didn't check them <laughs> out there, Scott, but yeah, some beautiful palm trees here. It's like a fairly shallow uh, area. Yeah, it is shallow right there. Then it becomes a little deeper and narrower on down. So this is just a, a tourist uh, area for now? It is, yeah. A number of tourists came while we were there. But like we saw in the overhead view with Google Earth, this is the only place with greenery, you know, in the area. <laughs> well, it seems, uh, yeah. I... <laughs> And according to uh, where Elim is, I mean, things don't change necessarily in the desert over 3,000 years. Well, that's right. Uh, so we'll, we'll see those wells there. You know, this could be it. This could be Mara. Yeah. Here where it gets narrower, you see it the water, water a little deeper. Yes, definitely an oasis. Uh, everything green, everything else around it. It is not beautiful. green. It is beautiful over here near the coast, uh, Gulf of Aqaba. So there's some visitors. So we're headed to Ilum Oasis at the white dot there. This is the correct site, it matches a biblical account. We actually have a palm seed pod here uh, that someone gave us uh, oh. from going to that very oh, site. Wow, Adeline. yeah, I didn't think about that. So we're gonna enter at the left dot and walk three miles through the canyon here to the oasis. There we see the Gulf of Aqaba. It's a beautiful sight here. The road stops here, actually. You can't go any further north. But we're looking over to the direction we'll be headed. We're going through this canyon here. So this is only by foot? By foot, yes. And that would bring back memories for the <laughs> being en entangled in the wilderness. Yeah, right. We got our own exodus going here. We're gonna back and forth, wind our way through this for three miles. Well, uh, is, it, is it a protected area? Is that why there's no road? Well, there is, yeah, there is no road going back in there. I guess they're trying to preserve it and so forth. Yeah, technically they could construct a road at some point. So the Saudis even recognize that this is something special. Apparently so, yes. Boy, that does bring back memories of Egypt, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, winding back and forth. A lot of gravel and sand you're having to walk through. It's kind of a slow journey. And so we're getting to the edge of Elam here. Some of the water there. 
It's a beautiful sight. And this would be, is it a spring just like Mara? Some of it is spring and some of it's been developed into wells, mm. such as this. It's had a casing put around it. But uh, Scott Parvey went around and told me, and he was able to count 12 wells there at Elam, you know, which confirms what the Bible says. There was 12 wells and 70 palm trees. And so the existence of the wells does prove it. Now, of course, it wasn't a well there probably in Moses' day. It was probably just a spring. And since then, you know, they've been developed or encased into, you know, well-type situation. I think the original Hebrew is implying springs, mm. 12 springs. And but, 70 palm trees. Yes. Well, both numbers of which uh, in Hebrew represent perfection or completion. So this was a, a definitely a welcome rest stop, obviously. Yes. And it does continue on down. It's kind of stretched out, the palm trees. And some people have said, well, this is too narrow, you know, for three million people, but it does open up here and it continues further east. And the canyon kind of fingers out with tributaries going out. So the people could have been spread out further away from this. And all they really need to do is pass through and grab some water. They, they weren't um, staying here for a long time. Right. Period. And so here we are going around to different areas. That just, just, just does uh, come up out of nowhere, doesn't it? There's nothing else around there. It's, it's an oasis, all right. I mean, that's what we're used to seeing for an oasis. And here's a well, another one that's been developed from a spring to a, a well situation. And there's more uh, around the Mount Sinai area that uh, are very curious that would support a large population around a place that uh, you would not typically find a population. That's right, God you know, was providing for them. They were grumbling, but uh, along the way, God provided the water for them. It's a good object lesson, isn't it? When, when we think all is lost and we've reached the end of our rope, that God provides us an oasis. Provides a way, mm -hmm. yes. Amazing place. So yeah, this is another area further to the east. I'm curious, did you have any trouble getting a drone into um, where you are? Yeah, I <laughs> well, I was preparing uh, how to handle that as I was entering, entering the country, and they, I have heard they go through your bag, and so I had the drone in my pocket and they ran my bag through the scanner and no problem. But uh, it's a very small drone, but it does excellent work, excellent video. So uh, yeah, mm. it's a beautiful sight. It's a great walk to do. So Elam. Now our next stop is going to be what along this route? Okay, I think we're gonna head over, I believe the next video is over where Jethro lived. It's coming up here shortly. Jethro, now he's, uh, he is famed in, even in uh, the Saudi Arabian society today. He is recognized, yes, Jethro. And he, you can see his name on the maps, ancient maps. So we're going to the town of Albad. It's really not all that bad, uh -huh. but it is an <laughs> interesting historical site. Caves of Jethro, Mugair Shuaib, that means Caves of Jethro, right on the map here on the right, Mugair Shuaib. It says Jethro on the map. Here is a museum there. You can go inside, they got some nice professional displays of the area. In back of the caves, we're gonna check out some nice, displays that they have there. It's a historical town. Look at that, a finished chiseling right in the side of the rock. Right. And it's, they assume that this is from Jethro's time. It is, it's, it's from Jethro's time. And uh, of course, I've read that Jethro may have lived in some of these caves. 
it could be, you know, Moses did too uh, during the 40 years of herding the sheep. It looks to be, you know, that looks to be a, a residence of someone who was prominent. I have heard that the, the facades were developed labor, later by the, was it Nabataeans? Uh, they carved them out at a later date. But they could have had a different facade, you know, back in Jethro's time. But they are beautiful. That's impressive. Beautiful, yes. Is anyone allowed to go into those caves? Do you manage you to get can, inside? Yeah, you can. This is recently uh, created sidewalk for people to walk around hmm. and check them out. It's a great site to go. And I'm going to put on my website tips on traveling to Saudi Arabia. Oh, excellent. So if folks want to go there on their own, they can do that. What to bring, what not to bring, where to put a drone. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Is there anything in, inside those caves at this We'll see a picture here. There are some, some tombs that have been cut out, and the particular one here we're going to look at. Wow, look at that. A town built on the side of a hill. But to think, you know, this is Moses' father-in-law, and I'm sure, you know, Moses was here too. Um, another biblical site, it's, it's amazing, really, that you get to visit. Going to Saudi Arabia, to me, was a, as exciting and interesting as going to Israel because of all these biblical things you can see. They're not just some Catholic church. Yeah. They are actual biblical sites. So are these so, yeah, tombs? These appear to be tombs, yes, cut out, you know, out of the bedrock. Looks like limestone. Now on the other side of town, we're gonna take a look at Moses Well. Again, this is a fenced in area with archaeological sign. The gate was open, thankfully. And another recently constructed sidewalk. And in the distance we can see the well. Moses Well. Why do they call this Moses yeah, Well? Yeah, some people say, you know, this is where, when he first went there, day one, and he came to a well, and the ladies were being intimidated by some of the men. Uh, yes. And so this is a possible site for that, but that's tradition again. But it is a large well, you know. Well, in this part of the world, uh, no pun intended, uh, you wouldn't expect to find a, a lot of sources of water. Well, this might be that, that might be it. Uh, if there's one sitting in the middle of nowhere, you would come to that conclusion. And this appears to be you know, a prominent one. It wasn't just some small place. But we're up higher here. We're able to look out and see Jabal El Laws in the distance in the center here. Mount Sinai, we're gonna go visit. It's part of the Jabal El Laws chain and we're told it's the highest of mountains in the region, and that's what it is. Here, Father says, the highest, most sacred mountain of that district. And so we've turned off the main road, and we're making our way out to the split rock. We got our four by four truck. You gotta have that four wheel drive to do this one. So this is a site we're heading to, the Split Rock. It's on the other side of the mountain. You could say the backside of Mount Sinai. And this was our first view that we saw. And you can see this prominent, you know, vertical, huge. It's amazing how it even boulder. is there. I don't even understand how it, it you know, it's, it, it would appear it, like It's that. sitting like on a 200, 300 foot tall hill, sticking straight up made our way around the back or left side of it and parked and then came around. You can see water erosion right here where they're climbing. Yeah, everything's smooth. That, that's, yes. not, uh, that's not wind erosion. You, you see the erosion in the rock. We're getting closer to it here. That's the Bedouin, the guy on the right there. Now here's a front view, you could say. This is the best view of it through the crack. You see my friends walking down there on the right, but that gives you a size perspective. We're standing in front of it here. This is just massive. And the water erosion right in front here.
you know, the water erosion in the crack even. It's just spectacular. And out there would be where they'd be encamped, the encampment area. So again, water erosion of the rock here inside the crack. You see massive amounts, so you know, high volume of water. Mm. Has anyone attempted to see if there is a, a spring underneath there? I've not heard that. I don't see any water running around. I guess God turned the spigot off and that was it, you know? <laughs> it served its purpose. Yeah, and so we're going straight up, looking in through the crack. It's incredible. And so this is the back side of the rock. It's not as impressive it's from the opposite direction. You know, it's, it's almost as if God was giving them a reminder of when he split the sea. I'm sure it looked like that all coming up and separating with a split in the middle, almost like a memorial to the crossing of another the Another split there, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. And looking another view here going down. Now, the amazing thing to remember, too, is that this rock, providing this is the right rock, and we assume it is, yes. that it was solid at the time before when Moses struck, Moses it. struck it. That's right, God split it, you know. I can imagine the, just the earth shaking of something like that, splitting in an instant. Well, and being able to see that, too, if you're one of the oh. people in the encampment and seeing this thing split. Yeah, after they had forgotten about the Red Sea crossing. And That's right, and they're already <laughs> grumbling and ready to strangle Moses. Yeah. Brought us out to the desert to die. Wonderful. Well, I certainly hope there are tours out to that very soon. As you mentioned, there is no road that goes out there. Someone's going to have to build a road to go yes. see this place. Unless you hire a Bedouin for $150. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So here it is from the ground out in the lower area. And that's the Bedouin fellow in the white? Is that right? Just some friends of his. Friends yeah. Of his. Came up there. And again, looking down the lower area here. You see water erosion. It's still there. Look at that. And down to the right would be the Mount Sinai area. Now this is the Jehovah Nisi in the King James uh, that was built by Moses after they defeated the Amalekites. I think it's translated as the Lord is my banner, perhaps. Mm. Um, Definitely a man-made structure there, yes. Yeah, a lot of detail originally. I think they kind of broke it up. Somebody did later looking for treasure, perhaps. Maybe they thought it was a burial site, mm. you know. But, De Desert has an amazing way of preserving things. Yes. Even some cultures uh, preserve their dead at the top of a, a dry mountain and the body's dry and... Yeah. But this had a lot of detail work to it originally. And then, of course, the backdrop is the split rock. You can imagine that would be almost like a lake area at one point. At some point, it would have pulled up. Now, I ran across these inscriptions. Nobody had told me you know, where they were or anything. But here you see, uh, every place whereon your, the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. And so they were putting markings of where they tread, saying, this land is ours. We were here. You know, here is our sandal, our foot mark, you know. Yep, tracing. And, yep. and here are some like ibex uh, animals are being hunted. See the bow and arrow. Some more here. And, you know, is this Moses with his arms being held up on either side? You know, he had to hold his arms up for them ah. to keep winning the battle. Here's a guy here on the right. He's like he's almost shooting down at something. 
Now, this is an image. I sent a bunch of these to a friend of mine. He said, this one here is the most impressive. It looks like Moses here on the right striking the rock and it's splitting in two. Notice the rock here on the left has smaller boulders in the front. Mm -hmm. This does too. And it's like the rock is split. And Moses has his rod up here and he's splitting the rock. Wow. So that's possible. But again, it's found here in the encampment area. But even the detail of the rock on the left with the, uh, the two different yes. areas of it. Right. And so we're heading out again to another area, seeing some of our friends on the way. They're looking at the drone, thinking it's a giant flying beast. <laughs> and so we're heading away, and we see some of our friends held captive here being transported. And so now we're heading to the Mount Sinai area proper, the mountain of God with a burned blackened peak. And there it is. And so this is one way we came in from the north. It's best really to come in from the south. But uh, this was our first view we had. I said to the guys, there's Mount Sinai. They said, what? And so behind the gas station back here, the furthest peak is a blackened peak. The closer peaks is like where Elijah's cave is and so forth. Quite amazing. There is the area in front of the mountain. Mm. A mountain of God. Beautiful. Walking right where the Israelites would have walked. That's right. And so... Musa, Musa's, Musa's Mount. Yeah, so he's telling us, you know, that's Moses Mount, Mountain of Moses. So there's, you know, local tradition there. And there's the burn black and peak on the left. Have you been up to the peak? I've not. It's technically off limits to climb the mountain. We had this local there watching us with binoculars all the time. <laughs> So Elijah's cave kind of in the middle there, and up at the top we see this tree between two boulders. We'll be taking a look at those sites. But we know that there was an altar at the base of the mountain. That's where we're headed is to... At the arrow there. Okay. Yeah. And so we have to turn off the main road. You need to drive beside these buildings here to head toward the base of the mountain. Locally, that local guy there, thankfully, is helping us, you know, get to this spot. We didn't know, you know exactly where to go. I'm assuming without local accompaniment, you may not be able to make it through there. Yeah, we might still be looking for it, so it's nice to have help. I think God sent him to help us out. But, so we're on the way toward the base of the mountain. We can only go so far. We're gonna park up here a little ways, following the fence. And up ahead here, I'm driving and filming, but this is a parking area where you can park your truck and get out. Well, why don't we leave it there? We're going to uh, leave us in. The base of the mountain, the, okay. the altar. Well, this might be the, uh, the center of that massive Saudi city that there is being planned. That neom, yes, is uh, supposed to cover this area, unfortunately. I don't know what the future holds for this. We see the blackened peak in the distance. We're heading out on foot. We're gonna have to do a lot of, uh, a lot of building to cover all that. <laughs> I know, it's just a gigantic area that they got planned out. They really need to develop this area with like a visitor center, you know, a museum, walkways like they've, they've done over there at Jethro's home. Even just to protect it. And you'd think yes. they would protect this. Yeah, uh, more fencing. Yeah. Possibly even with Neom on, on the horizon, uh, the, de the locals may just demand that this, this be protected. Uh -huh. We're getting closer to the altar area. You can see some white marble up ahead here. 
Now, people say that the, the, the black is just a different type of rock, and it, it's not. Um, it's a superficial coating yeah. on the rock. So here on the left, we see some remains of some white marble some pillars, columns pillars or, or yeah. columns here. Quarry, or apparently this was quarried out. This is local stone and so forth. As you're kind of heading up toward the Blackened Peak. Hmm. But uh, so we're going around this area. We hmm. see pieces of the columns here. And just in back of that yes. is a corral we're going to take a look at where the animals would have been placed awaiting their donation to sacrifices. <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> and so Dan here is standing in the corral. It's kind mm -hmm. of an L shape. Over here to the right is the actual altars right here. Mm. Again, why would these be built in the middle of nowhere other than for that purpose? Yes, it you know, fits the biblical record. And the Black and Peak is up there. You can't really see it from this angle. So this is the end of the corral, the start of it, so to speak. Black and Peak in the background. And there's a stream that was coming down the mountain, a river or stream just behind this. There's a lower area. So we're stepping inside the corral. Have any uh, excavations been done of this area to find uh, animal think, dung? And I think the Saudis did do some excavating here, yes. And this corral is like separated into two halves, you know, left to right. So maybe there's two different types of animals, you know, they were placed in here. They were kept separated. And it goes a little ways and it turns right. And so the animals first coming in, you know, cannot see the execution taking place mm. up ahead. And that method is still used today. Yes. So we're walking through the corral. To the left is this drop-off. Or right here at the very edge, it drops off to the stream that's coming down the mountain. I don't think I've ever seen footage that is this up close and personal with this area. Yes, this is, this is up close, and we're going to fly the drone over this. Here's an opening. And then these are the altars starting on the left here. Appears to have been five. There's two here on the left. The divider is missing right here, but this appears to have been two. And then there's one there, three, four, and then one to the very right here. We don't really see too well. It appears to have been five. And with the drone, you can see it much better. So here's a start of the drone video. Again, the stream bed you can see coming down the mountain. The pillars here in the foreground. Very well thought out. This is uh, just definitely made for a purpose. Mm, yes. And of course you need water, you know, in the sanctuary service. There's water that's needed. This is right, you know, basically at the source of it, you could say, as it first comes down the mountain. Yeah, they would have everything they need here, wouldn't they? Yes. And so it hangs aright. And of course, the children of Israel were never allowed to get to this area. You know, this area is off limits. You couldn't come near the mountain. This is a little bit higher view. Did you find more of the uh, sandal uh, inscriptions here? Not in this area. Of course, the longer you could look, the more likely. Again, you can see the altars. There's three on the right here in a row, and then one larger one just to the left of that. I imagine it was divided in two. Someone would have to know what they're looking for to see that those were altars, I suppose. Oh, but there it's pretty obvious. Yes, isn't it? now you're looking straight down on them. That's a good view right there. It's amazing. Now, here's all of it at once. It's really interesting. So the animals would come on in on the right. On the right. Move the way to the left, altar area to the left. To the left, okay. There's the altar area. At the bottom of the screen there. Okay. Yes. 
again, this is a biblical site, you know, amazing. And more of the, those are more of the pillars? Yeah, more of the, that's some of the pillars there. Well, I would stand to reason that Solomon would build those. Uh, he, he did the same at the crossing site. At the crossing site, yes, pillars. This would be more pillars. You know, and so there's the burned peak. And as we're leaving the altar area, heading back toward the car, we saw yes. these carved images of these appear to be folks that are dancing. Now this is not the the uh, the altar to the golden calf. No, is it? it's no. not. So here we can give a uh, relation to the mountain. We're turning back here toward the southwest, and we look. And could this have been carved at the time of the golden calf? Perhaps you know they're here dancing. It would make sense. Some, yeah. some kind of revelry. It going could have on been during there. the golden. Although this is not next to it, but it's you know it's in the general area, so to speak. You see the ibex. Maybe that was a ticket booth to get tickets to the party. <laughs> to the party. <laughs> uh, so, at this point, we're going to look up at the tree between two boulders. Some people have wondered, could this have been the burning bush? Hmm. And Moses climbed the mountain up there, and God speak to him. If you notice, every time God spoke to Moses, basically, he had to go up on the mountain when the children of Israel were there. Well, perhaps this is a way for God to get him up there, and God spoke to him. You are able to get right up next to him. Yeah, this is that. Scott Parvey shared this with me. These are huge boulders here, and this is a tree. Has anyone tried to determine the, the age of that tree? I don't know. Now, there's the blackened peak there in the distance. Okay. It kind of gives you how it's related in position, and here are a couple of guys there next to it. Wow, so this tree is not on, or is it on Mount Sinai? It, oh, it, 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 it is, it's, it is. it's the mountain just to the right of the burned peak. Okay. And then the plateau is on the other side of this, basically. So it's right above Elijah's cave then, It is, yeah, so there's Elijah's cave. I understand that is quite a hike. Yes, that's what I've heard. And it's not that deep. It's plenty deep though, you know, for one person, ah. a few people. But look at the view he had out his living room window here. <laughs> the view of the valley below. And apparently from that vantage point, you can see the altar to the golden calf. You can, yes. I hear Scott turned around and got in the back of it. And you can see it's got some depth to it. Oh, it does too. The view out here. See the main road down there? Yeah, the one where everyone is absconded for their money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the ticket place. Yeah. And so that. here is a close up of the Black and Peak, some more pictures of it. This would be kind of from the plateau area looking over to the west. And again, the blackened peak. And there you can see some of the light colored rocks where it, it's not, it is. It's, yes. it's not all uniform. It's right. not one type of rock. Some people have suggested, well, it's uh, basalt on the top and something else on the bottom or, or vice versa. Yeah, it's, it's burned on the surface. Wow. So there's the view from up there on the Blackened Peak. See the valley. Where Moses saw all the nonsense going on. All the dancing. Yeah, so there's the mountain, there's the Blackened Peak. If we see in the image here, the still, we can look at it here. There's a river or creek that came down the mountain next to the altar. We mm -hmm. saw that previously. As it came down the mountain, it collected in front of the mountain and created a, a type of lake in front of the area there. We see on the left side here, there's a depression or lower area. And we're gonna fly the drone over there next to that spot. And we're going to see a series of five or six round formations that were vertical wells going down. They were lined with stones. 
we see the, the tops of the stones of some of them in our drone video here. But I can start the, the video going here. So this is how the, the Israelites were able to stay here and get water. We had collected in this area, didn't just run away, and we're taking off on the main road headed toward this lake area in the bottom left. So according to the, the building that we just passed there, it's almost like a little retention pond. You can sort of see the, the size of that there. Right, yeah, and that's a, a guard house on the right for the area, and then the fence saying this is an archeological area, a sign there. But here is the edge of the lake, and in the bottom, bottom area here, we see a round area that's been dug out. One of them was dug out in 1985 when Ron went back there with the uh, Saudi authorities. Oh, I see it there now, yes. And okay. we'll stop it here, and I'll kind of outline four of them with some white discs here. And there you see, oh, and there's okay. actually one or two continuing to the left. We'll go on the ground here and take a look at them. But so these, the water would come in through the sand into these wells, and so you would have basically, you know, filtered water coming into the bottom of these wells. The lake would feed these wells. You know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, wow, look at that. Look at that. So this is a remnant here of another one. Yes, this is a semicircular shape there. You know, they would have been around. This is one that they dug out. And there's a ladder still going down in there. I think it went down 10 feet or so, and they, they think it went down further than that. So these have all been filled in. They've been filled in you know, over 3,500 years. More round or semicircular. Very close together. Shapes. They're right, you know, in order, orderly fashion. Another one here, part of one. And there's part of one at that spot. Like you said, this was at the edge of that, well, we saw it's it at the lake. edge of that lake. Yes. So this is, would have been, uh, now this is for the same reason. Uh, a lot of people, uh, why don't we freeze it there for a second? I'll still pick of it. I still find it so curious that the, the Saudi people who are not Israelites have protected this. That's right, I mean, they respect Moses, which is a good thing. And here you can see how elevated this one is. Okay, oh, I see the stone, okay, the casing that goes down. I see that now yeah. on the edge there. Yeah. Wow. Now how far How uh, far across, are they about six feet uh, across? No, it's more like 12 or 16. These are large. Mm, oh, there you see there, yeah. Yeah, so again, that's the one that was dug out. So again, evidence of there having been there for some time. Now, I flew the drone near this guy's house, near that white guard shack. He got angry, came over, ran his uh, truck in front of mine, trying to block me off. He got out yelling and screaming, <laughs> waving his cell phone. I jumped in my truck, I took off 60 miles an hour. He passed me going 80 and he blocked the road. This is a 10 minute standoff that we had. Oh my goodness. That must have been uh, a little nerve wracking. In reverse, if he gets out with a gun, but at least pull, tell him to come up beside him so we can talk to him. And, uh... and so it was a standoff and finally another local there came up beside me to help us out. We had said hi to him previously. He's, he's, he's being mean. <laughs> Of course, the guy didn't understand English, but I, I tried to show uh, a motion of a fist. We'll see it here in a second. To book, to to book. that way. To book, to book. He's blocking the road. He's blocking. He doesn't want us to go by. Yes. And so he's asking, do we want to go to book? Yes, we want to go to Tabuk, ah. which would be that direction. He went up there to speak to the man. The man was calling the police, I believe. So this lasted for 10 minutes, but this is part of it. What was going through your mind at this point? We didn't know what this guy was gonna do. He was acting like a crazy idiot. Very angry about the drone, but didn't go over his house. I know where his house is. It's to, to, to the right of that guard shack. And Dan got out to go to, 
talk to him. His door was open. A guy came up behind me to, to block me in, another guy. I saw it coming. I backed up two feet real quick. I turned the truck to the left to try to get around both trucks. We got to book. Get in, Dan. Get in, Dan, quick. And so we're telling Dan, get in the truck, get in the truck. We're going to try to go around both vehicles. And Dan got in the vehicle and we took off. <laughs> and the thing is, seven miles down the road is another village. And so I'm thinking, is he going to call his friends ahead in yeah. the next village and say, stop these guys? Mm. So we had you know seven miles to see you know what's going to happen next, and luckily nothing happened. Wow. Um, but well, you say you don't have a movie here, but I'd say this is a movie. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we'd heard stories about you know these the locals there you know trying to get money out of you, and I was thinking ahead of time they're not going to get any money out of me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to keep them from, you know, harassing us if I can, you know, but so anyway, we made it out of there. Um, now this was another stop we made north of Mount Sinai about 5 miles. You know, we're told in the Bible that the uh, children of Israel were dancing around the golden calf and there were 3,000 that were not repentant and God ordered the men of the tribe of Levi to execute them. And this is one of two sites that they're, they're basically side by side, you know, a couple hundred yards apart. This one, some people think, is a more modern site. It's got these carns here or these grave markings in their semicircular shape. But we're going to see these similar shapes over at Mount Sinai in a minute. Huh. So it's like they're sort of linked, you know, these, these formations semi-circular shapes, but these are types of headstones. I was gonna say, it looks like a tombstone of some yeah, kind. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now some people, you know, again, say this is more modern, but we're gonna see another site that's kind of similar. But it's protected, obviously, with this wall. They have a wall around it. The gate had been torn down, but we weren't disturbing anything, just taking photos. So obviously, again, here, even the locals recognize this is something special. At least, you know, the Saudi authorities do. They've got it walled off. That's a significant wall. That's not some barbed wire fence. Yes, it's a large, large wall. Have any, to your knowledge, have any, has anyone exhumed anything? That's what I was wondering, if, you know, if they've been excavated. I'm sure there would be something here but you never know about you know grave robbers over 3,000 years, what could disappear. Hmm. But a lot of circular, semi-circular shapes. Now, the area, like I said, just to the west of this, uh, southwest, this has got a fence around it, a regular chain link fence. Again, archaeological sign. And this is a larger area. The gate was not open there. And this is another suspected grave site. This is, yes. And in my drone, we're gonna see some circular shapes. I didn't see it that day, but looking in the video afterwards, you can see some. Do those circular shapes mean anything? Do we find that in any other culture? I don't know. If, culture. if we stop the video here, okay. on the left, you can see a circular formation of stones Yes. on the left. And there's some others to the right of that and down. Um, we see them there, yeah. So there, and I'll start the video again here. But so to me, it kind of links them together, you know, these circular shapes. And up at the top right, where there's more stones, there's some vertical stones for headstones that we're going to take a look at here. Scott Parvey sh shared these with me. They're from that area. So now these, I guess, could be dated all the way back to the children of Israel, those sites yeah. there. Now back at Mount Sinai proper, you can see some of these carns 
these monuments that are semi-circular in shape. Again, a, the same concrete block wall. There's Mount Sinai in the distance, okay? The, the, pre, the peak, and we're east of it over here and looking over the wall. So this is putting these here at Mount Sinai and we saw them, you know, five miles away. So our next topic is going to be the Golden Calf Altar. Ah, yes. Which luckily the gate was open. Um, That's a rarity. I, I've heard that most people that try to go there, they can't get in. That round the golden calf altar. The golden calf oh, would well. have been placed on top of this. And ah, he knows what this is. He's directing the way oh, here. Oh, I see, yeah. And Dan here is taking a picture of some painted murals here in red ochre paint. These are not chiseled in, but they're painted. And you can see them in red here. Mm. You can see the Apis bull. We see a couple of them, and then some Ibex. Another bull at the top next to the red man. Quite amazing. And again, you know, these are of Egyptian design, these Apis bulls, which you don't normally see in Saudi Arabia. Exactly, why would they be in Saudi Arabia? It doesn't make any sense, it's across yes. the sea. Yes. Amazing. And we can see how this relates to Mount Sinai, not far away. In plain view. It's across the main road. And here near my hand are some like triangular red shapes. I don't know what that is. There's a number of them. You see the red man and mm -hmm. then these red triangles. I don't know if those are shields. What is that, you know? Interesting. Interesting, well, I'm sure someone will figure that out eventually and hopefully if there's more tourism and more uh, archaeological sure. digs and, and research that goes on here, we will. The video here, Okay. see the various inscriptions at the area and the gentleman there was kind of pointing out various inscriptions of the, the Apis bulls that we're going to see. He needs to be the tour guide when they start selling real tickets to this place. Well, we tried to give him a tip, but he wouldn't, you know, take any money. But huh. so here's a nice layout of. In the foreground is a smaller altar, and in the main golden calf altar is this larger one here. Again, we see the Mount Sinai in the distance. It's quite a view right here. If you can imagine the golden calf on top of this, quite an effort to build that thing. They had to really. Some people say it's natural, be natural because of the way the stones are cracked. Okay. That it's actually kind of a natural stack. Um, but still, you could tell, like right at the top there, you can envision the golden calf on a pedestal there. As it would be kind of impressive, yeah. And of course, the, the inscriptions are what give it away. Yes, the Apis bulls. Now, here's the secondary altar. They said, they, they said that they offered sacrifices to the golden calf. Well, this is a secondary altar, and of course the fence is around it also. We see the peak of Mount Sinai in the distance, but so the animal sacrifices, this is the main altar, and then we're looking in back of that to the smaller altar where the animal sacrifices would have been made. So they made the, the sacrifices on the smaller altar to the calf on yes, the larger the, altar. Yeah, the animal sacrifices are made right here, apparently. And now we're walking back toward the main altar area. A stack of stones here. Oh, and there they are. Yeah, and you can see the apis bulls, the ibex. And these are Egyptian style. Now the Saudis did not have these type of, or whoever, the Midians or whoever lived there. They don't have these type of drawings. This is you know, Egyptian style. The top left here, this looks you know, Egyptian. And you see some smaller ones. And again, going over top of the stack. Walk around the stack stack of stones here, and here's another area you can see 
more Egyptian style. And again, the desert has left this relatively untouched. All of the all of the drawings are obviously on the darker parts of the of the rock. Yes, it's amazing they're still here. They could have been, you know, more of them back in the day. It looks like it. Some of them are chipped off. Some, yes, yeah, some have been broken off possibly, but it's amazing this much is left. I'm glad they put the fence around the area. But you know, they do need some authorities out here letting people in the fenced in area. I wonder how many of these drawings have been tried or have been attempted to be chipped off and sold on a black market. That's possible, yeah. Um, they need some order. I wouldn't mind paying a fee, you know, to get in here, you know, if, if they would establish some type of order. So here we are with the drone. You can see these up higher on the rocks, these apis bulls. Mm. And some recent rainfall and a puddle on the top. Yes, and there's, you know, there is that crevice or concave area on top. It could have been where they ground the calf down up on top. Mm. Again, you see another bull shape. It is amazing to me how these things are just, with the dry heat, essentially baked into history. They just, they, they don't go anywhere, they're just there. It's amazing how God's preserved it. Now here's several more. So I mean, this fits in with the story, you know, golden calf, here are all these, these apis bulls. And there we see Mount Sinai in the distance. It's a good view. Now is there any, uh... so now let me, go ahead. that yes. could be where they ground the calf down, right there, that depression. It could have been ground on top of there. Mr. Wyatt wondered if that did take place up on top of the rocks here. Has any gold detection ever been attempted He there? actually saw a sheen at some point uh, where it could have been residue of gold on top. So quite amazing. Entirely possible, for sure, because this is obviously the spot. Yes. And so we're gonna head up to Kadesh Barnea. This is an area where Moses struck the rock, but he actually sinned in doing so. He was just supposed to speak to the rock. And so we're in the wilderness of Zin in southern Israel. And this is an area with a large amount of erosion on the rocks. High, Again, from water, obviously, here. Yes, a high volume of water had eroded away the rock. We'll see it here shortly. Almost looks like a dry glacier. Yes. And my particular drone here is a little bit damaged. Uh, <laughs> a little shaky. <laughs> pilot error, I guess you could say. And over here on the right, in the shadows, this is where the water came rushing down. And you see these cutouts in the rock and also on the sides. Ah. Even the sides here on the left are washed smooth. Then you see these cutouts in the rock from high volume of water running fast. Yeah, swirling around in a, like a, a rapids type and, of thing. Yeah, digging these out. This couldn't happen in just some gentle rainfall. So again, this is the second rock. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. And I understand there is, uh, even in this spillway, there are uh, rocks that were purposely placed there as baffles. Yes, we're gonna see that baffle rock here in a moment. Again, see this erosion on the right? This is high level of water having to erode the rock away. And there's the baffle rock we're gonna look at in the, on the left. But here's where the water would have rushed down out into the encampment. So we've basically been, been following the children of Israel from, you know, from site to site on our journey. Apparently seeing evidence of it along the way. It's amazing, you know, this is biblical evidence, one site after another. It looked like there have, that there is not an absence of water here at this, you know, at this point in time. They apparently had, you know, a gentle rain of some sort before my visit here. 
There's a baffle rock in the center. Ah. Now, it was eroding the rock rather deep. I, I assume they wanted it to spread out instead of continuing to cut the rock down. It's like six feet deep in that area. But here's some more of the erosion. Wow, definitely powerful. There is some. Yes, there. and this communicates to that baffle rock. This is, you know, six feet deep right here. And it appears they placed this in here vertically and it would have caused the water to spray outwards. They would have placed it over here to the right where it's wider and it would have become wedged mm -hmm. in this spot. And so that's the encampment in the distance and the water would have flown down. Oh, and there you see the sediment being held, held back. Yes, and it's wider back here. They could stick the rock in here. It was mm -hmm. pushed into this spot. And quite amazing. Mr. Wyatt did some, I believe it was a frequency detector test out in the encampment area. He was picking up gold readings in a certain area, which could be consistent with those people that were swallowed up. The okay. earth opened and swallowed them. Ah, yes, okay. Yes. And I believe he found some artifacts out in the encampment area also. I found some, some type of carving when I was out there, one of my trips out there. But, so this is in the wilderness of Zen. And he struck the rock in anger, you know, which is sad. And do we have that, where that rock is? I didn't see, you know, a definite rock per se. I don't know if it's- So it's not as obvious as the split rock. I don't know if it broke into many pieces, you know, and basically disintegrated or what, but there's not a nice big rock there. So this is in the wilderness of Zen also. This is another encampment that they made around this mountain, Mount Hor. And it was here that Aaron was buried on top, we're told. And we're gonna go ahead and climb up the mountain. It takes about 45 minutes. I was gonna ask, is that a sandy surface? But now we see it, it's quite solid. Well, it is kind of soft. It's kind of uh, loose material as you're going up. It's not, not pure sand per se, but it's rock, sand, sand. So how did Ron know where on this mountain that I don't know, there. I don't know. I believe he used, you know, different types of detectors to help him locate the site. And so we're climbing up the ladders here. Oh, obviously you're not the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this is actually kind of a public uh, site. And it's kind of an l shape design shape, the mountaintop but it stands out from the valley, it just goes straight up, you know, the, the sides of the mountain. Very unique looking. Wow, look at the view from up there. So they would have been encamped all around here. On top here, you see how flat it is. And again, the area where they could have encamped. It's flat on top. You can see the other end of the mountain down there. So again, this is another biblical site of Mount Hor in the wilderness of Zen. Some people think that means wilderness of sin. <laughs> you know, this is where Moses sinned um, by striking the rock in anger instead of speaking to it. And we're gonna try to make our way down here and for those who are not familiar with where this is in Israel, where is this exactly in Israel? It's about 20 miles or so southwest of the Dead Sea, this okay. area. So near Sodom, Gomorrah, all those yes, types of sites? About, yeah, about 20 miles from there. Yes, that's a crow flies, I guess. So, I believe this might be called Mount Zen or something. On your local maps. But it is uh, accessible, apparently. They're not it too is. worried about uh, people falling off, I yeah, guess, at your own risk. I saw a number of people coming out there. I was out there for some time, out there by myself. Again, the view. 
you can imagine the children of Israel all around there, 